Good evening, everyone, community members, those in the audience, parents, students, and others who are interested in this evening's subject. My name is Vivian Ekchian. I'm the proud superintendent of Glendale Unified School District. In attendance in the room, we also have board clerk, Mr. Sahakian, and board member, Ms. Ganell, and our executive director of Parents Teachers Association, Ms. Lerna Mirians. Welcome. The subject uh, that is going to be presented today is of importance to our entire community and actually one that is discussed nationally. We care deeply about our students and their safety. And we're finding out that in a variety of settings, our students may be exposed to um, narcotics in general, and fentanyl in particular has become an incredibly important subject. And the only way we can protect ourselves as a community, as parents, as also um, family members who care deeply about everyone, is to make sure that we have information that not we only possess, but we're able to share with others who may not know as much as we do. So today I have the pleasure of introducing our presenters. I'd like to thank Mr. Yul Masekian for facilitating the process this, today and uh, thanking Glendale Police Department for being great partners in this work. So it's my pleasure to introduce Detective Cornejo. Please identify yourself. Let's give him a big hand. <laughs> Detective Rolando. <laughs> Detective Jimenez. <laughs> Detective Landsberger. <laughs> and also family therapist, Ms. Sona Hovsepian, who will be presenting to us information that will be hopefully of value to everyone and those watching at home as it is being recorded, certainly we can visit again. This is not a subject that should be presented just once. This is one that we have to be learning together as a community and protecting our youth from it. And it's super important for us as a school district, and I know it is equally important to you. So thank you and welcome for spending your evening with us. Now I hand it back to our valuable presenters. Go ahead. Good evening. Uh, thank you for uh, having me, having us. Uh, I'm uh, Detective Guillermo Jimenez. I work the Vice Narcotics Detail for the City of Glendale. I've been with the uh, department for 17 years. I've been with the uh, detail for approximately seven years. And um, this past year, um, collectively by, by the department and as a unit, uh, we, we came together to, uh, to start this program to help educate uh, not only ourselves, but uh, the, the residents, the community, and more importantly, the, the, the students within the Unified School District. You know, we, we've all um, have, have stories and have been involved with uh, fentanyl as it relates to um, overdoses, usage. Um, we talk to um, narcotic users, dealers on a daily basis, and um, it's one of, probably one of the most scariest things that we've come across um, as uh, police officers and narcotics detectives. So uh, we decided that, you know, well, we should get more involved in educating um, everybody. So we came up with this, uh, this slideshow uh, to, again, educate ourselves, educate everybody here. And uh, just, just so um, let you know that the first slide is kind of more like a shocker. It's kind of like, a, like, a, like a, a police call that came, that uh, we decided to put in. It's from... Uh, a 21-year-old Glendale resident who overdosed and sadly passed away, and um, we wanted it. We we wanted to input it in here because we wanted you to hear and see what what reality sound what it sounds like, you know, and what people, family, officers go through. Uh, if anybody, um, like I said, if, if anybody doesn't um, want to hear it, it's not it's not too long. Um, you're more than welcome to step out, but uh, we're gonna go ahead and I'm gonna go ahead and play it. Oh, 
This 25-year-old grew up in Glendale, uh, grew up pr- coming to the uh, Glendale Unified School District uh, schools, um, hung out most likely over in Pacific Park uh, where me and my partner were at just giving this uh, the same uh, lecture or a presentation. And um, when officers arrived, they obviously were too late. You know, the, the family had found their brother uh, in bed, already deceased, and he's been—he had been there for some time. Um, this case was was followed up by um, homicide, and our uh, and our detail, uh, the vice narcotics um, detail, um, by the help of the family. The family handed over the the son's uh, f- phone phone number, and we went through the messages, identified some uh, potential uh, dope dope dealers. Uh, we set up a surveillance and we went after these uh, dope dealers and um, ended up uh, getting a, getting an arrest. Uh, two two individuals, one another one from Glendale, another one from outside the city. We ended up recovering a, a large amount of uh, fentanyl, methamphetamine. We got a gun off the street, um, but we weren't able to Id- positively or definitively di- uh, um, identify that the drugs that came from them were the ones that uh, that that uh, individual took. So we weren't able to um, file any charges on that. But again, that's what we're, we're, we're doing. We're not only um, going through the going th- uh, going through these uh, overdoses, but we're investigating them. We're going after the dealers and we're going after the people that are responsible for poisoning um, and, and 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 giving administering and distributing these drugs to to everybody, the community members. Tonight, we now know how long one of the drug dealers charged in the fentanyl overdose death that claimed the life of rising rapper Mac Miller will serve behind bars. Ryan Rivas in federal court said he was merely a middleman and had no idea the counterfeit oxycodone pills that he gave another dealer were laced with fentanyl. After Mac Miller's mother read a heart-wrenching statement in court, a judge sentenced Rivas to nearly 11 years in prison for the death. Mac Miller is, of course, one of thousands killed by fentanyl in recent years in the numbers only continue to skyrocket. In fact, more than 100,000 died from the drug during the pandemic alone, and they are still counting the dead from that period. The victims are young, old, rich, and poor. This crisis is impacting communities across the country. Tonight, part one of a new ABC News Live series of reports that will run over the next few weeks. Our Bob Woodruff and team have fanned out across the country to see the crisis firsthand. His first stop in our series, Poisoned, is Nashville, where he learns what makes this drug so powerful. 911, what's the exact address of your I just came to check on my son. And uh, he is in here uh, sitting on the couch and he ice cold. I need the police and ambulance. His dad opened the apartment door. He started screaming like I've never heard anybody scream before. What's your son's name? Romello. Okay. My son Romello Marchman was killed through fentanyl poisoning. Did you have any idea what could have caused this at that time? No. Um, I had no idea what fentanyl was. The truth is that very few have ever heard about fentanyl. 
Fentanyl's a complete game changer. 50 to 100 times more potent than morphine. In the first 18 months of America's COVID pandemic, a record-shattering number of Americans died from drug overdoses. And we are still missing months of data. But we do know that most of those deaths involved fentanyl. A few grains of salt worth of fentanyl will kill you. While fentanyl has gotten growing attention in the world of music. Prince died of a drug overdose. Fentanyl. Rapper Mac Miller found dead with fentanyl. And in Hollywood. Michael K. Williams found dead in fentanyl laced heroin. It's so the reason we put this th that slide in there is uh, like a lot of people don't know what fentanyl is. Fentanyl is um, a synthetic opiate opioid that was um, has a medical purpose, right, to, uh, for pain management, for um, people that obviously have uh, a legit medical use for it. But um, drug dealers, uh, people in China obviously had took advantage of, of knowing how to develop this. Uh, there's no need to, you, you don't grow this, you don't uh, plant it, you, all you need is a certain amount of chemicals to make it. And um, now that Mexico, the drug cartels, got wind of it and know how to make it, um, they're, they're receiving this fentanyl and these uh, chemicals to make it down in major labs um, in, uh, in Mexico. They're uh, lacing other drugs like cocaine, crack, heroin, um, pharmaceutical pills. They're, they're making these, these pills out in these labs without any specific dosage. So the reason why we put, put that slide is that because a lot of our youth, um, including myself, like I said, I listened to rap music. I grew up in, uh, in the 90s listening to hip hop and rap, rap music. But a lot of these um, rappers nowadays glorify this, this, rap, this uh, the use of, of narcotics. They, they glorify it, they, they put it on their videos and our kids are listening to it, listen to it. And get and have much more knowledge than us as parents um, think they do. You know, they they know what it is. They they have they uh, they they hear it. And again, they these rappers and and um, uh, movie stars. They you know they they get glorified in movies. They get glorified in in um, in uh, music. But they all have, they have a dark side. You know, they didn't expect to uh, to die when they took their drugs. So we have um, here in Glendo, we come across um, a, a big fentanyl uh, crisis, um, just like we did a few, several years ago with like a heroin. Um, we've had probably about 193 overdoses um, in 2021. Uh, uh, fentanyl has been uh, the, probably the most, in, mo the most popular drug that we've come across taking um, Presence more than meth and and heroin, um, and it's like I said, I'm talking more about Glendale, but it's it's actually nationwide. It's 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 everywhere, everywhere. Everyone that you talk to has either meth, heroin, fentanyl, or or, or both, or all three. Here's some just some of the numbers in Glendale um, in 2020 when we were at the height of uh, the the um, COVID pandemic. We had a, a large amount of overdoses. Um, deaths were were up as far as with um, as it relates to fentanyl on the, on, on the left. And then going into 2023, our I mean 2021, I'm sorry, um, our overdoses skyrocketed, but the deaths kind of uh, went down. And I think that has a lot to do with um, the education of uh, an introduction of Narcan being trained up on it. Um, um, uh, users actually carry Narcan with them because, again, you know, they, they have an addiction, but they themselves don't want to die either. You know, we've talked to a lot of these uh, users that carry Narcan with them right in the same pouch that they have their narcotics with them. So I think that has a lot to do with it. And I actually uh, reached out to um, the, um, the program director that gives out these statistics and they're still working on the, the statistics for 2022 to 23, I mean, to 21 to 22, um, and we should have them here shortly. Yes. Yeah, yeah, please. We actually brought some Narcan, uh, a Narcan that we carry with us 
Um, each detective carries this with us um, in our cars when we uh, issue search warrants, um, that we have an idea that fentanyl is going to be um, in and around. Um, when we handle fentanyl in, uh, in our office, to um, either to package, to take photos of it, there's always um, an officer or a detective or someone with us in the same room. We um, handle it with special gloves, masks. Um, that's just some of the, a lot of the precautions that we take um, to when we handle it. A couple of just uh, some t t statistics that uh, we came across nationwide that um, regarding overdoses and um, overdose related deaths. In this video, watch as a Bartlesville police officer wearing protective gloves is packing up drug evidence believed to be laced with fentanyl when he slowly starts to collapse. Becoming ill, lightheaded, and actually basically passed out or, or fell. Seconds later, a rush of officers coming to the rescue. I don't know what would have happened had they not acted so quickly. Sergeant Jim Waring says officers quickly gave him Narcan, which is believed to have saved his life. Police say this is the first time they've had to deal with something like this, where they had to give one of their own officers Narcan. Really fortunate that, uh, one, we had this available to us, and two, that our officers um, really adhered to the training and paid attention to the training. Another layer to the opioid epidemic, and an eye-opening to what these men and women behind the badge have to deal with. You know, even though the officer may not be physically dealing with an individual, all the evidence and, and, and things that we handle on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, that can that can harm you too. So those are those are kind of things that we do. Like we, um, myself and my, my partners, when we handle evidence, when we uh, recover evidence for search warrants or have to test um, the narcotics for uh, uh, case filings, um, that can easily be one of us. You know that, w however he was handling it like a poof of smoke or something could have gotten the air airborne. And although he was um, using a protective uh, gloves, uh, he might have inhaled, inhaled something. And if it wasn't for um, officers being there uh, immediate, for immediate assistance, um, it, could have, it, it could have been fatal. So um, those are just kind of the kind of things that w um, we go through and that we're susceptible to um, on a daily basis. So now I'll tr turn it over to my partner. Uh, Landsberger. Good evening. Yeah, my name is Matt Landsberger. I've worked for Glendale PD for approximately 15 years, and I've been assigned to our Vice Narcotics Unit for about the last eight years. Here are some signs this is just a video of a about overdose. how to uh, administer It's hard to wake the person up, or they seem overly sleepy or confused. Their breathing has slowed or stopped. Their pupils are the size of pinpoints. Their lips or fingernails are blue. If you see any of these signs and you suspect an overdose, call 911 immediately. Then administer the naloxone, also called Narcan nasal spray. Remember, naloxone only works on opioids. It will not treat an overdose from sedating medications such as benzodiazepines, which include Valium, Clonopin, Ativan, and Xanax. Start by moving the person to their back, then follow the three P's, peel, place, and press. Take the spray out of the box and peel back the corner tab to open. Hold the spray with your thumb on the bottom of the plunger and your first and middle fingers on either side of the nozzle. Tilt the person's head back and support their neck with your hand. Gently place the tip of the nozzle into either nostril until your fingers are against the bottom of their nose. Press the plunger firmly and all the way to give the entire dose. There is only one dose, so do not test it first. Then roll the person to their left side. If they do not wake up in two or three minutes, administer a second dose of naloxone. Stay near them until emergency medical help arrives. Contact your local... An important thing that this video mentions is to call 911, call 911 right away. And we want everybody to know that when somebody is overdosing, it's important that you call 911, the police. What? It's not working? Uh, can you hear me? Um, it's important to call the police, not only us, but the fire department will come as well. And there's a good Samaritan law to where if you're with somebody who's overdosing, 
you're not going to get in trouble and they're not going to get in trouble for overdosing. That's something that's very important because people think I don't want to call because I don't want my friend to get in trouble. I don't want my brother, my sister, whoever to get in trouble. It, you're not going to get in trouble. We're going to come. We're going to uh, administer first aid a, until the fire department gets there. Then they're going to take over. But it's very important that everybody knows that no one's going to get in trouble. So that's a, lot, a big thing that especially kids worry about. They don't want to get their friends in trouble. That's not going to happen. We just want everybody to uh, be safe and to make sure that they call because it's very important that the Narcan gets administered um, sooner than later. So that's just, if you take one thing away from this lecture is don't be afraid to call 911 because you're going to help save their life. And again, nobody's going to get in trouble. This is just some uh, common drug paraphernalia that uh, you could even find around your house. Like, actually, sorry. Like, this, this is just a straw. These are paper clips here. This, again, over here is a straw. These are um, paper clips that were extended. You can see the ends are burnt. So what they'll do is they'll put the pill, like right here. That's a um, fentanyl pill. This, it looks like an M30, which is oxycodone, but it's an actual fentanyl pill that they'll heat up and they'll stick it to the end of the paper clip and then they'll inhale it with the straw. They'll use, um, take like a pen out and take both sides of the pen. They'll use that to ingest the, uh, the, the smoke into their lungs. That's what gets them high. So if you're looking for things around the house, you know, straighten out paper clips with burn ends, spoons that are bent because they'll, if they're going to do inject heroin, they'll put the heroin in, a, in, in the spoon with a little bit of water. They heat that up, then they draw the heroin into the needle. They'll inject that into their, um, into their arms or wherever they're going to inject it. Again, burnt straws. You see burnt straws around your house. Straighten paper clips. Those are common household items that you might see around your house and you might could find those and not know what they are, but with some education, you'll know that your brother, your sister, whoever, husband, wife, could have a, a drug problem. <clears throat> this is just some more paraphernalia. Obviously, on the left is the needles, but there's the spoon I was talking about. Again, that's how they'll, they'll heat up the, uh, whatever drugs they're going to use so they can then draw it into a needle. And then there's some more, again, the straws, which is very common, uh, and, the, and the paper clips there. This is methamphetamine. On the right is basically how you would see it come across the border in the, the larger packaging. And then on the left is what somebody in patrol or sometimes when we, what we see um, when we stop people is they'll have the smaller amounts, but it goes from, there's probably 50 pounds in that bag to a gram um, that's in the bag to the left. <clears throat> yeah, meth's really cheap to make. Uh, we've been seeing a lot of it. It's, it's gone down in price, I would say, almost eight to ten times in the last eight years since I've been up in narcotics. So it's very accessible. I would say meth and heroin are probably the two biggest drugs that, that we see here in Glendale. Fentanyl is definitely becoming more prominent, especially with all the pills. But uh, yeah, definitely methamphetamine and, and fentanyl are, and heroin are all um, big drugs here in Glendale. And <clears throat> this is heroin. It's usually... Um, going to be like a sticky black tar um, substance. It'll smell like vinegar. Uh, if it's not sticky, sometimes it'll be in a, into a, like a powder form, almost look like hot chocolate, like the, the packets. So again, if you get a vinegar smell, you're like, oh, that's, that's really weird. There's no vinegar here. You know, in your kid's clothes or something, more than likely it's going to be heroin. It has a very distinct smell. These are a couple different types of cocaine. On the left is powder cocaine. On the right is going to be crack cocaine. Uh, a lot of the things that we've been seeing is stuff that we've been sending out from our cases or from patrol cases. And it's actually what we think is coke or they get arrested for cocaine and it comes back from the lab as fentanyl. Because we actually send our drugs out to the, uh, the sheriff's department lab and they'll actually do the official testing for us. And a lot of the stuff that we're seeing now is any, a lot of powder substances is coming back as fentanyl, which is scary. Because somebody, you know, coke's more of a party drug. So they're going to think on a Friday, Saturday night, <clears throat> Excuse me. they're going to be out with their friends partying. Someone gives them something, hey, this is Coke. They've tried it before. Okay, I'll do it. Not knowing that they're potentially going to ingest fentanyl, and one dose of fentanyl will kill somebody. You know, people do things one time, whether it's a pill, you know, Xanax or uh, Percocet or what they think that is, or M30s with oxycodone. One pill will kill them. These people aren't, you know, drug users have been using for 20 years, and they're so addicted that they have to do it five times a day. We're seeing 15-year-olds that are overdosing on doing it for the first time. 
because their friends are giving them this pill. Oh, try this. They take it, not knowing that this pill was manufactured in Mexico. It came all the way here. You know, their friend bought it from somebody on an online ad or a friend of theirs, and they just got a, a hot dose of fentanyl, and they're going to die from making one bad decision. So that's another very important thing. That you, you know, tell your kids, don't take any type of pills or any type of powder from, from anybody that's, that you don't know. And if it's not like a prescription, I would say the majority of the pills that we see now um, on the streets, they're all fake pills. They're not from, uh, from doctor's prescriptions that people are getting. They're all pressed and they're all, again, they all come from Mexico. The majority of what we see uh, are those pills and the majority of those have fentanyl in them, whether it's Xanax, Percocet, um, Oxycodone, all those things that we're seeing now have fentanyl. So it's, it's very important only take prescribed medication. Don't take any medication from anybody else. Don't try anything because literally one time could end your life. Again, this is a, Xanax is another common thing that we've been finding um, or Alprazolam that people think they're getting pills from their, the dealer on OfferUp or Craigslist. They're buying these. They're using them. They're overdosing because they're fentanyl and they're not Xanax. And these are the most popular ones, um, oxycodone, blue pills, M30s. They, they have a bunch of different names. Um, but that's the same pill that was on the, uh, the paper clip there that people will heat up and they'll smoke it. This is the most common pill that we see. Um, when we've gotten seizures and we've gotten 10,000 of these pills in one seizure. And they go anywhere from like $5 all the way up to $20 online. So they're talking a lot of money just for one little pill. And these are, these are the big ones. These are the ones that uh, on a lot of the overdoses we're getting, these pills are found at the houses. So just be very careful because, like I said, one of these pills could literally change your life and it could kill somebody that you know. And once again, this is just a continuation of, like, the different forms that fentanyl has been coming in. Um, here is... Obviously, like we said, the pills, the powder form that it comes in. And then along with narcotics, usually uh, the drug dealers have some sort of weapons to protect themselves. Obviously, this is, uh, you know, this is their way of making money. Um, there's other people that are out there also to get them. So therefore, with narcotics come the, the weapons to, to protect themselves. Um, A lot of the things that are coming out in the media right now, uh, and like we said, nationwide, are these colorful pills. Uh, if you see them, I mean, they look like rainbow-colored pills. Uh, drug dealers know, just like they do with the tobacco industry, if they get a, you know, flavored products. Uh, here you go. You bring different, uh, different colored pills, which is going to attract kids. And once again, you might have a little kid that thinks, "Oh, these are my little." Flintstone vitamin pills, and here they go. They grab them, take one, and next thing you know, they're passed out on the floor because they're overdosing on it. Um, here's the pill form that it uh, that they make it, and then on the left is pretty much like the solid substance. So if we're if we're gonna describe fentanyl to you, I mean, we can pretty much just say it's anything that you can imagine, any form, any shape that it might that it can be. Uh, pressed into that's what it's going to look like we can't simply just say oh your fentanyl is only going to be a solid substance a liquid substance or it's only going to be in a pill it's many different uh, shapes and, and forms um, here are a couple of uh, the next couple slides are going to be narcotic cell slides uh, if you see up here it's uh, offer up craigslist we have snapchat and instagram uh, this is big, obviously, if it, you know, anyone that has kids out there, if you mention any of these, especially Snapchat and Instagram, they're going to, they're going to know how to work it back and forth. They're going to tell you all the ins and outs. They're going to tell you how to communicate with people, how to communicate, how to send videos, everything. And, and this is pretty much what they're doing with uh, online stuff right now. I and mean, you can pretty much go online and, and find this stuff on OfferUp, on Craigslist, and even on Snapchat. And the thing is, what well, we want to kind of tell the parents and, and kids out there, you might think that any of this stuff that's, that's set out there, I know a lot of people think Snapchat, boom, you send the picture, send the video, 
And once they view it, it's gone. It's actually not gone. Snapchat actually holds on to it. So there is a way to trace this stuff back. And we're not trying to scare everyone, just trying to inform everyone, hey, this, this stuff doesn't just disappear. Um, we put these up because we think it's, uh, we're not trying to show you how to go out there and purchase this stuff, but uh, we think it's very important for the parents to know what to look for. Uh, right here we have a basic uh, Craigslist ad, right? And it's labeled as a uh, roofing tar, right? Best quality Huffington brand, right? In reality, what they're actually advertising is heroin. So you reach out to this uh, ad and sure enough, it's, you're, you're not trying to purchase, uh, you're not trying to purchase a uh, roofing tar. Uh, the balloons, this was very common uh, before. It, it was a, a way to package the heroin where you'd put the heroin in there and they'd be able to package it up in the balloons. And for whatever reason, if you're going to get caught by law enforcement, they just end up swallowing it and eventually end up passing it out and right back out onto the streets. Once it's passed out of your body, you're ready to sell it again. So once again, you're getting all these narcotics. You don't know where it's been or who it's been in, but people are still out here using it. Um, very common right here. We keep talking about oxy pills, right? M30s. Uh, this is an ad for uh, Roxy board shorts, size 30s. Is it a real ad? It's not. I mean, what they're really advertising and, and the way that the system won't identify it as uh, selling oxy pills is by putting roxy board shorts here here are a couple more ads i don't think of anyone that would actually be interested in purchasing this shirt um <laughs> doesn't look good to me but hey um what it is another ad it's a shirt seven dollar shirt two milligram xanax t-shirt so obviously it's telling you the the they're only asking $7 for a pill. And, but once again, offer up won't take it down. And it's actually good because they're advertising a t-shirt. And to the right of it, once again, Roxy board shorts, $20 for pill. And even in the, on the description of it, it's, it's telling you, I mean, men size 30, it's giving you all the hints and everything that they want to put out there, just enough information for you to actually reach out to them and know that you're, actually not purchasing shorts, you're purchasing pills. Oh. And uh, for this next slide, we're gonna have uh, Detective Rolando talk about it. Uh, this was a local case that we had uh, with a young person that overdosed and he was the lead detective on this case. Is that the case? I'm not, you can hear me? Um, I'm not sure if this is the case that Detective Cornell was referring to, but That's just more like online. yeah, this is just more online. Uh, before I, I get into my case, the the synopsis of my case, kind of one of the things that, that, that we've noticed as officers and as parents ourselves is involvement. Like be involved, not, I'm not saying that we're not, but be involved in your kids' lives. Like look into their phones. A lot of the questions I get nowadays is I'm not, am I allowed to grab my, you know, my child's phone and I kind of like laugh, I go, who pays for the phone? Sorry, this is a little louder. Um, and, and the parents always say, well, I do. Well, grab the phone, it's your phone, they're just borrowing it. You know, these, you know, nowadays, these kids are empowered and they think they can, they can run the roost and all this stuff and they can't. You're the parent, grab the phone. If they don't want to give it to you, grab it and look into it. They're borrowing it. You know the code. If they change the code, they lose their phone. Because anything that these, these kids do in their lives, just like us, if anyone gets a hold of your phone, they're going to know everything about you. It is what it is. Our phones carry, you know, they're our, our, our daily diary. They catch everything. They know everything. Whatever your, your child's doing, I'm pretty sure it's, it's going to be on their phone, either on their social media accounts, their text messages, whatever. It's going to be on there. And feel free. That's my opinion as a father. I only have an eight-year-old, so I couldn't imagine the stress that, you know, parents have with teens nowadays. I am not looking forward to it. But 
when my son's old enough, it's, it's, I'm a dictator. He's going to do what I say. And that's that. So how do you guys, how do you switch slides? I'm sorry. How do you go to the next one? Just hit the X. Okay. Okay. This is just more stuff. We can go all over. This is just Snapchat. This is what, this is a counterfeit Xanax. This is what it looks like. Again, don't take any medication that you don't get from a, from a pharmacy. Uh, these drugs are coming in from Mexico and they're not making them in a lab. They're making them in some backyard and the person that's making them doesn't really know quality control. They're just, you know, pouring it in a bucket and swirling around. Yeah, that looks good. And then you, you know, that pill makes it across our borders. And that's what happens. And they use fentanyl because it's super cheap. It's made in China. It's uh, most likely shipped to Mexico in drums. And they buy it super cheap and they're lacing it with everyone because it's super addictive. Is this it? Okay, so this is the case that I was talking about. I'm going to use this mic. Usually, I like to walk around. So this case involved a Glendale resident. Um, I'll only give you a small portion. I don't want to describe it too much because it's sensitive. It's a 15-year-old uh, girl who was experimenting with drugs. And subsequent to the investigation, later on, we, uh, when I say we, the Glendale Police Department detectives, we were able to determine that she knew she was doing drugs and she knew people were dying of overdoses, but she says, I don't care, I'll be fine, whatever. Well, unfortunately for her, it didn't work out. She uh, used a fake pill that was had a hot dose of fentanyl, and she lost her life. Um, in Glendale, um, we have a relationship with the DEA. There's laws out there, for sure federal laws. Anytime a human, an adult, child, it doesn't matter, dies subsequent to a, a drug overdose, we go after, we try to identify the seller, and we, we conduct a joint investigation, and we try to get a federal indictment. Unfortunately, in this state nowadays, uh, it is what it is right now. The current climate is you don't go to jail much in California. You just don't. That's a side note. Um, however, federally, you do. So um, what happened was, in this case, ourselves as, as a narcotics detectives, in conjunction with our homicide detectives, we worked a joint investigation with DEA. We were able to identify what we thought was the dealer. We conducted the uh, narcotics street case on it. We identified the dealer, saw him do a deal, arrested him for an unrelated deal, initiated a search warrant. And in that search warrant, we were able to get probably, I don't know, a couple thousand more fentanyl pills, some mushrooms, a rifle, all kinds of stuff. Subsequent investigation, all that stuff, the homicide detectives were able to identify him as the person that sold that juvenile the drugs. He admitted to it. He, you know, based on his admission and, and the evidence that was gathered, we were able to get a federal indictment. He was just indicted um, a few months ago, and he just agreed to a, I want to say he's going to do anywhere from 15 to 20 years for that. So, I mean, that gives the, the family some some closure. But... Nevertheless, the girl's gone, and she just used it once, and she passed away. There's, there's, there's nothing you can do. And these are just, you know, if I don't know if you guys could read that. I know I can't without my glasses, but um, that's just, you know, your your typical conversations. If you're in your uh, your kids' phones, their DMs on Instagram or whatever other social media outlets they may have, feel free to go in there and and read them. I know my my partners do. I know I would if I had a, a a child that was, you know, texting and all these things. Just your basic vernacular. They'll try to use code words like the, you know, oxys or board shorts or you have a, a roofing tar. Roofing tar is code for heroin. All that stuff. Your child's not buying roofing tar at 10 years old or got 10, 15, 16, whatever. They're not. Um, signs to look for, we all know what someone looks like when they're not right, right? Drug, drug addicts, the, their symptomology can, can range from one drug to another, but, but an opiate, you know, common indicators, pale skin, sweaty, their pupils are really, really tight, they're irritable, uh, they're broke, they're always going outside and meeting with someone in a car for like five or ten seconds and leaving back. You start finding out that your money's missing out of, out of your wallet. It's, it's obvious. It's obvious. And yeah, your child can be an addict. It's, it, you know, drug addiction is undefeated. 
it, it can affect anyone. It is what it is. I personally lost a cousin to a drug overdose two years ago. She used fentanyl, and she didn't make it. Yo, can I get 15 blues? That's probably oxys. They, and the the scary part is the uh, the counterfeit drugs that they're making now. A couple years ago, for us, it was obvious. Okay, that's counterfeit. We can just tell they were very grainy and very edgy. Well, the cartels they get better. They run a legit business. So now the counterfeit pills they're really hard to tell. I know I've we've had pills. I'm like, oh, those are real ones. You know, maybe they broke into a pharmacy. Comes back fentanyl. I was like, wow. So they're out there. And again, why do they use fentanyl? Because it's cheap. It's super cheap and addictive. Why do they lace it with cocaine? You would think they wouldn't want to kill their customers. Well, they rather get them addicted. They get them hooked on cocaine and fentanyl. It's just more money. Uh, not too long ago, we had a case here in, in Glendale. Well, there was a house with a, like a bunch of banker, uh, excuse me, biker gang in it. And they went down to Fletcher and San Fernando area, bought what they thought was cocaine. They came back and started snorting it, having a good old time. And all four of them dropped dead in the house. We as officers typically are the first to arrive on scene. We got there and administered Narcam and they all survived. But they all went thinking they were snorting coke and maybe they were, but they all had fentanyl. They all survived, they all got to the hospital and as soon as they were coherent and functional, they all left. So it really made, we tried to investigate it. We, there, was, there wasn't much we can do when you don't have a willing victim that's willing to talk to us and let us see their phone and all that. So it is what it is. So who knows what you're going. And these are just you know signs of, that a household member may be addicted to opiates. Um, I have some, some photographs that are super graphic that I won't show you, but uh, this is, you know, those called track marks. Just over time, their veins collapse. They don't, usually we've seen drug addicts that they have, their veins are so damaged from just continuous, consistent drug use that they'll inject it in between their toes, on their ankles, I mean, just anywhere. And that's, they get infected. They're not using clean needles. They're using needles with, they have MRSA on it, staff, and that's what you get. Um, this is just kind of stuff that I kind of went over with. Kind of physical telltale signs of someone that's a, that's an addict. Should be pretty obvious to you if, if you're, I mean, we all know our kids pretty well. If they start changing, you know, their cheeks are sunken in appearance, they're losing weight, they're not hungry, uh, new pock marks and scabs in their face, discolored fingertips. I mean, this is just all telltale signs. I, I think I speak for all of us. Unfortunately, or, or, or fortunately, we I can look at someone and be like, oh, that's a drug addict. It is what it is, I'm not being judgmental. It's just they're a drug addict. And we can probably tell you what drug they use. It's just obvious to us. And it should be obvious to parents if, they're, if their kids aren't well. It's out there, guys. We're not, we're not trying to scare you or anything. We're just, or maybe we are, but we're just trying to let you know that it's out there. And we're getting um, the overdoses, in my opinion. Again, the stats aren't out yet because we're still in the middle of, or almost in the middle of 2022. It seems to me that there's overdoses every day. I would say the overdoses are going up exponentially without really looking at the numbers. Maybe uh, the percentage of people dying are less. I think the numbers of deaths are going up just because more people are using it. However, maybe the percentages are down just because of like Narcam and awareness and, and that stuff. So hopefully we can get the numbers down, not because of Narcan, but because people stop using drugs. But we can only do so much. Um, this uh, goes back to kind of what we talked about, officer and investigator approach. Obviously, our job as detectives, as narcotics detectives, we focus on the sellers. We don't, obviously we deal with the users. However, we're not really, it, I don't want to say concerned with the, with the users because we are with treatments and all that stuff, but we need, we can't find sellers unless we talk to people that buy the drugs. So we use the users to get to the sellers. And obviously within that, you know, there's treatments and we try to help them out. Um, now there's laws that, uh, that you, can, you can come forward if there's an overdose, call 911 and render aid to your friend or whoever that you and him or her and him or whatever just use drugs and they passed out. Where back in the day, kids or adults were a little bit, you know, there was, they were fearful of, oh man, I, I was here, I, I gave it. Nowadays there's laws to kind of protect them from that. 
um, obviously if you sold them or if you, you gave it to them, maybe not, but, but even then, you know, please stress to your loved ones, your kids, call 911. That, that's the, we, we want to save a life that, that you're, you're probably going to be fine in terms of prosecution or anything like that. This is just a number, um, that we have. If you guys want to jot that down, unfortunately, I mean, we can sit here and, and, and speak at it at nauseum, but it, it's when I grew up in the nineties, you know, I, when I was in college, it was beer and, and marijuana and whatever. Now that's, it's not, we have 15 year old kids overdosing and dying. 21 year old kids, adults, rock stars, it, it, it's out there. And a lot of it does come from Mexico, from the border. Um, we we seize thousands and thousands of fentanyl pills. It'll probably just fill up, you know, five or six of these bottles. 5,000 fentanyl pills is a sandwich bag. It's nothing. They're getting truckloads of this stuff every day. Bordered from California all the way to Texas. There's only so much we can do. So it's good that you guys are here. We, we thank you guys. Uh, we're going to open it up to any questions. Does it feel... Please feel free to ask us any questions. Yes, ma'am. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. <laughs> you, okay, go ahead. I'm so sorry. Okay. Um, I just wanted to reiterate um, the resources that we have. And um, one of the websites that we have here is um, a SAMHSA website that helps you find a treatment uh, center. So um, definitely feel free to use some of these resources and um, we, have, we should have another slide. Um, and we have this slide also for parents and community members where um, you can scan this barcode or visit the website to um, find a, a naloxone um, in case you need to have one with you. I know sometimes pharmacies have it, have it available, but not always. So if you need to carry one with you, um, visit the website, or if you can, uh, scan the barcode so you can have access to it. I don't, is that the last slide? Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, we'll open up for questions. If anybody has, an, has any, um, you're welcome. We'll, we'll feel free to answer anything. My question is, I know that the Narcan um, doesn't have any adverse side effects for people who are not overdosing. But in the, the one slide, the uh, police officer caught a whiff or something and almost died. If a person's performing CPR, is there any risk for the person giving CPR to have some, you know, like if they have peanut butter allergies and they give CPR to somebody that's eating peanut butter, there could be an adverse side effect to that person. Is there the same adverse side effect to the person giving CPR if the if the person's overdosing from fentanyl? That's a good question. And to answer your question, generally speaking, no. Um, the mic. That's a good question. And uh, we've asked that when, when um, we had our training for Narcan probably a couple years ago now. Generally speaking, the answer is no. However, uh, it doesn't take a lot of fentanyl to to cause a reaction. If uh, in this case, if the officer, you know, he had a reaction because he had a baggie of fentanyl and he passes out, and that baggie's still there and still open, then the answer is yes. Or if maybe it spilled on his or her uniform and, and whatever, then the answer could potentially be yes. However, it can it can you know they breathe on you and whatever you know went in their body come out and affect you. I was told no, and which kind of makes sense to me. Nevertheless, you got to be safe. When 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 we deal with fentanyl, we generally we just had a search warrant last week. We we walk in with the we we hang the uh, the Narcam on our belt. It's like a it's an extension of our gun belt, unfortunately, but that's kind of what we have to do. And when we handle the evidence in the office, one of us will handle it, and the other one and the other detective will kind of be like off to the side, kind of watching. Just you know. You, we could die doing this stuff, unfortunately. But that's a good question. Yes. More, more, mostly now, more chest compressions, and not no longer they, they recommend to do, um, you know, like go up and fake uh, breaths, just chest compressions, 
Uh, call 911 and keep doing charge conversions until medical uh, arrives. Yeah, what happens is, and that's a good point Detective Jimenez put out, what happens is when uh, when you find someone that's unresponsive, obviously the first thing you do is you check for you know your 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 pulse and if they're breathing and all that. If they're breathing and they and they they're alive per se, but they're not responsive, sometimes they'll instruct you to to start Narcan and that'll wake them up. The the chest compressions and the life saving measures like like CPR, that's like you get there, they're unresponsive, you give them Narcan, it's not working, then you got to start going you know you gotta you gotta start with cpr and all that stuff obviously call 911 get that ball rolling but also start life-saving measures any other questions don't be afraid don't be shy Um, do we have any data on success rates of um, intervening the incoming stream of fentanyl? Uh, I'm sure they're doing everything they can, but do we have any data in terms of success rates, finding them to prevent them to be dispersed? Like in terms of intercepting it from coming across? Uh, I don't, off the top of my head, no. Um, I don't, we don't have that. It's hard to tell because you can never tell what gets in. We, we know that we're intercepting more fentanyl, but to be honest with you, that just means that more is coming across. I, we've talked about it and we've talked, we, we have relationships with, with Border Patrol and, and uh, it's probably safe to say, I would say that over 90% of the drugs that are, they try to get across, get across. And it's not just the border, it's shipping containers, it's airplanes, it's boats, it's submarines. So I would say, a, a large percentage of the drugs that are uh, that are meant to come across our borders, it's pretty successful that they get across. So that's a good question. So it, it, it's hard to tell if we're getting better. Yeah, we are, we are we are making more seizures, but I'll just be honest with you, that just means that more drugs are getting across. Yeah. And I'll, I'll just close it uh, real quick with, I have a 15-year-old uh, son uh, who, who's a senior in high school. Um, he, second day of school, he too, um, it hit home with me because I had just finished talking to him about fentanyl and, um, you know, how to be aware, what not to do, um, and what to be look out for. And then the second day of school, uh, one of his, uh, classmates who was a well-known cheerleader, uh, on the, uh, varsity, uh, cheer squad, uh, took a, try to, uh, an M30 pill and passed away. And she died you know, talking on the phone with her boyfriend. Her, her boyfriend, again, wasn't probably aware about um, who to call or what to do. He ended up calling a friend and a friend called another friend because maybe they were scared or they didn't want to get in trouble. But you know, their parents ended up finding their daughter passed away and dead in, in, uh, her, in the bedroom. And how traumatic is that, not only for the parents, for that immediate family, for, you know, I'll even go as far as like my son, you know, he know, he knows her, he spoke to her, they were, you know, acquaintances in school, and for, you know, entering his senior year, that, you know, I think that really hits home, you know, because um, I, me as a father, as a police officer, I'm involved with my son, I I know his code to his phone, I have an app in there that that I follow him everywhere he goes, at any, I do give him his privacy uh, because again he's growing up and he shows that he's responsible. But at any given time, I on demand if I ask him for his cell phone or I think something's up, I um, he has to give it to me. If he doesn't, he knows what's going to happen. He's not going to have a phone. I'm going to take away the car. I'm, he's going to be grounded. Um, anytime he he goes outside to, oh, I'm going to go meet a friend. I'm going to go out there and I'm going to see who he's meeting up with because those are a lot of the transactions that are going on. You know, these online services and on online deals that we explained, they're actually coming to the front of your house, people's houses and delivering these drugs to kids, you know, people that are interested in using it and doing it under our noses. So we got to be more aware and be more involved. If we're more aware and more involved, the kids are going to think twice about doing anything like that because they don't want to get caught. So if you... Um, Take away anything like that. Get more involved with your kids, and that like that phone is gonna be is gonna tell tell you everything. So, 
Uh, oh, you have a question? I was seeing on the news some of the candies like nerds and I don't know Skittles or whatnot. And during Hall Halloween, everyone was kind of nervous, and I didn't let my kids trick or treat. But um, are there candies we sh that are like if it's chocolate, it's probably not laced, or is there like what percentage of kids think they're having candy and end up dying, or are we being overly so paranoid? From what we've seen, it's been nothing like actual candy. It's more they're disguising it in the boxes when they're shipping it, so they might. Stop somebody at the border with 10 boxes or 10 bags of Skittles, and they're putting the pills in the, in the Skittles package just to get them over here. Then they get them over here, and then they disperse them that way. But it, they're not going to give your kid, you know, a 5 or $10 pill for candy just to mess with them. So we haven't seen it in any candy. I know there was some stuff on the news about, oh, it's packaged like candy, the colors. They're just making it that color to make it a little more like eye-popping for the kids, kind of like the flavored tobacco and things like that. But... From what I've heard, I don't know if anybody else has heard anything, it's not going in Nerds, it's not going in Skittles or Starburst. It's more of a concealment method to get it from one place to another. Then they get it there, they take it out, they, they package it up in some of the bags that you saw and, and disperse it that way. But the, the colors and the candy look is just more appealing to the younger generation and it more catches their eye. So there, I wouldn't worry about anything um, in, the, in the candy with your kids. That's just my opinion. Just to add to that, um, I agree with everything the officer said. Um, there are also games that kids play called Skittles. Um, so it's not Skittles that they're eating, but they put um, pills in a bowl. They're different color uh, pills, and they pass around the bowl and try and experiment. So. The game is called Skittles, um, and it usually happens at parties. But um, again, it's not laced candy, but it's pills that look like candy. So, yeah, they're usually they're speaking with one of our partners, who's a school resource officer. They're usually referred to as cocktail parties. And so, if you again, you see something on a phone where you see a cocktail party, yeah, that's common amongst. Elder, you know, uh, us as um, a formal way of getting together, let's go to, we're going to have some cocktails. But high school kids, if they're saying, I'm going to go to a cocktail party, that's typically what they're thinking, Skittle party, um, where they're, you know, they're getting their hands on um, pr uh, prescription pills, maybe from um, the medicine cabinet or off the street, and they put them into this bowl, and then, yeah, you're experimenting, you're experimenting it. And that's how a lot of, um, like, parties are getting uh, overdosing. You had a question? Uh, yeah. Uh, I'll... I wanted to see if it's possible to give uh, educational seminars like this to educate us parents on how to basically search and monitor the, f the phone of our kids. Like, I'm not as savvy on the apps, the Snapchat, I can open it, I can read, but I cannot trace the history. Uh, same as for the other communication um, um, apps that there is that the kids are using. and. It, it's they they learn it so fast, but for us to spend the time figuring it out, it's uh, like um, I I don't know how to look at the history, how to uh, you say um, I thought the information is being lost uh, once they open it, so I don't know uh, if I can trace the history. So I I think us as parents need education on how to look at those uh, conversations, uh, what, or actually what to look for. So uh, I know it's very generic, but if you go on YouTube, you can pretty much find anything. Um, as far as the Snapchat stuff goes, I know we said, I, I know I said earlier that there's stuff that it does get saved. However, it, it erases on the phone, but Snapchat actually has it. Um, stuff like that is going to be hard for you to actually go back and, and look for it and, and go through that stuff. But anything else like on Instagram, um, even uh, internet search history, uh, depending on the type of phone that you have, uh, if you YouTube how to, you know, how to do anything pretty much nowadays, uh, it'll give you a step-by-step, -step, and then there's going to be, there, there should definitely be multiple videos on, on how to go through their history, what to look for, and like a lot of the stuff, like a lot of the slides that we put up, uh, the emojis and the, and the phrases and all that stuff, that's all stuff off of the internet. We literally did the same exact thing that you uh, 
that you're going to be able to do to where you just go on the internet, you can YouTube it, you can, you know, go on Google and, and search up how to find this, what to look for, and the telltale signs will be there and, and it'll instruct you on how to do it. So I heard your um, request clearly. I don't exactly know who we're going to bring to make that happen because we will be creative and we'll research. And it's a need that we all have. So uh, give us just a little time to find the right experts to help us navigate through what we as adults need to know that the kids learn faster. And may I just uh, thank you all very much for coming here and being so helpful to us. Um, let's give them a big hand. Thank you for having us. And I think we need to have these more often. So hopefully you will get the word out there that a session like this occurred because our parents need to know how to help themselves. Obviously the first tool is to communicate with our kids. There's always a root cause as to why kids do what they do. Sometimes it's beyond the level of just experimenting to also wanting some level of attention. And of course, uh, funds are available to kids, but you're the ones giving it to them, and these things aren't free. So if you can have communication around, may I just add to everything else you've said, um, about what do you need the money for, or can I buy it for you, or looking as to what's being ordered online, those are very important steps, and we all have to be aware 24-7. In terms of the school district, we have purchased Narcan kits for all of our schools, elementary, middle, and high school. So uh, hopefully it will never happen. But if it should happen, our school staff have been trained on how to use it. But that has to go beyond the school district. We're all in this together to keep our kids safe. And there's no judging as to who's a better parent or who's not better informed. We are, um, as one community and one family, responsible for our safety of our kids. But we also have to have many conversations with them of what matters in life and the risks we take. We constantly take risks. But the cons uh, consequences of some risks are a change of a lifetime. And that's the conversations that I hope we can have at different times of the day with our students, our kids, and uh, look at it as a, a crisis. And in a crisis, we all have to help each other. So I also think that if you see something, say something. If you see someone hanging around the park too much who doesn't look like someone who actually is park age, you need to bring it to the attention of the school or law enforcement. We can't control everyone's intentions, but we all know that some people may be there for the wrong reasons, and we're not pointing fingers. It'll be up to others to really research it, but protecting our kids requires that we're very aware of the environment in which they function, know who they associate with, and give them only the resources necessary to do what is required for them to be able to do, and not to be spending it on things that uh, can be harmful to them and to the entire family. Every time something happens, beyond the family and the friends and the extended family, our entire school system is impacted by it because we all care about our kids and the friends will remember forever. And I uh, thank you very much for being here. Thank you for those who are watching from home. Let's make it a habit to come together and learn together. So I appreciate you. Thank you. <laughs>